Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Turn It a Punk Classics, a show where we take old episodes of Turn It a Punk that have been lost from the internet and return them to their previous glory by sticking them back on the feed. You can find this podcast on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and all other forms of social media. Well, that's pretty much it. At Turn It a Punk, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Lefford Damien. I play in a band. More information can be found at F U C K E D U P dot C C. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy another TOAP classic. Hey, Lars, thank you so much for sitting down with me. As I was just telling you kind of before we started, this is a, a big one for me. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. I'm glad that uh, we're finally able to, to do something like this because we're both super nerds. And when two super nerds get into the same room, a lot of nerdum can happen. Absolutely. Well, you are speaking my language already. And as I know <laughs> from our hangout a couple of weeks ago, uh, I got to steer it from going completely down a wrestling path because, <laughs> my gosh, I could punish you on that topic forever uh, as well. So, uh, but I guess I want to start them off the way I start them all off. Sorry, start this off the way I start them all yeah. off, which is how did you get into punk? Do you remember the first time you kind of ever came across it? Yeah, you know, I, I was probably, um, you know, because I, I think, you know, it all goes back to like my first um, introduction to music. It was all from my older brother, Robert. Mm -hmm. So he brought everything home. So when I was four years old, I heard Kiss. You know what I mean? Basically, like, then it was like Kiss. Then it was like uh, ACDC. Then it was like Cheap Trick. Then it was The Cars. Then it was like punk and oi um so i want to say probably 79 80 my brother was a skinhead so he brought home a lot of the reggae music um there was a kid named sean gregonis who moved into town he was from like san luis obispo and his him and his his dad moved up they moved on to our street and he was kind of like the first punk rocker we had ever seen and he had you know shaved head white t-shirt combat boots rolled up jeans uh, walked around with a boom box playing like, I think it was like X or some shit, <laughs> a black flag. And he was like the first punk rocker I think we ever saw um, in real life. And then, you know, with that, you know, brought this whole sort of sort of sub subculture to Sherman Palms, Campbell, California. And my brother, of course, you know, being, you know, we were sort of the outcasts anyway. So we kind of sort of, he gravitated towards Sean, him and Sean became friends. And then, of course, as all great younger brothers want to be more like their older brothers, that I kind of, uh, you know, and I was always into music. <clears throat> so I remember hearing like GBH for the first time or, uh, you know, the Cockney Rejects. It was mostly the English stuff, you know, the, the, or, you know, the one band, the first American band I ever fairly, really, truly fell in love with was Social Distortion, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um and that was like one of my first shows with Social Distortion, you know, and I got to meet the guys and you, you know, it was, it was such a, it's such a cool thing. Cause you were, um, you know, you were kind of same as, uh, you were the same as everybody else in the, in the scene. There was no, there wasn't any rock stars, you know, there wasn't any, um, breathing fire and, and explosions, <laughs> you know what I mean? Which I, maybe it could have used, who knows, but, um, uh, you know, but my, my point is, is, is that it was just like, we were working class kids. We we're actually working poor before the term was even fucking made, you know? So we grew up in project housing and it was, I think it's just the music, the attitude, it was just, it was really easy to gravitate to. Cause even the kids, even this music that was coming from England, we could identify with because it sounded like they were coming from the same neighborhoods, you know what I mean? Absolutely. Uh, about breathing fire on stage. Every time I've seen a punk band try and do that, it's <laughs> ended in a disaster. I'm going to say a good 60% yeah. of the times I've seen a band try. So maybe it's better well, to go back. Well, I'm, I'm actually happy that, to say that I've never, ever seen a punk band try that. But um, the, the infamous Toronto They Live tragedy show uh, that was a legitimate tragedy for one of the singers of They Live, unfortunately, that night. Got you. Which it is was a great... Which is a great movie featuring our friend Rowdy Roddy Piper. Absolutely. And that was totally where they got it from. I think they opened the seven inch with a sample, if I'm not mistaken. Really? Back when you could get away with that such thing. Yeah, yeah. Before, <laughs> yeah. Before the, that was that was all pre internet shit. That's when you could 
literally jack a movie sample, put it on your record, and no one would have found out for for twenty years. You know what I mean? Yeah, I kind of remember like the Swarm doing it on a ten inch, and they had like the whole thing was like lifted uh, taxi driver snippets. And that was the first time I remember a pressing plant being like, nah, you can't do this. Well, you know, you know, it's a funny story like before, you know, and which never made the record, but I still have the master with the, the sound bite. There was a Spider-Man TV show and we had, um, sick of it all singing backgrounds on avenues and alleyways. And Spider-Man basically in the TV shows, it says not to steal anybody's line, but it's clobbering time, you know, from the, the thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we sampled that, we sampled that for the beginning of, for, for the intro of an, uh, avenues and alleyways. And it was off that Spider-Man TV show at the time. And, uh, we recorded it, whatever, and from a VHS t- tape, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and I think BJ Pappas, who was this, photographer in new york she would do like a um you know every time rants had rolled through she took photographs sick of it all agnostic front she took photos of everybody she's on yeah. the h2o record i think right you know is that her yeah. yeah yeah pretty sure yeah yeah no that's that's the h2o record i'm trying to think on on like um well she definitely took photos of them yeah right yeah I've, I've definitely seen her photography before i will okay. i will check this and put this in the beginning of the show <laughs> right but I think she was the one that got us the sample. So, and it was kind of like an homage to Sick of It All because, you know, at the time we were thick as thieves and, you know, and, uh, but it got, it it never made it to it. It never made it to the mastering, but who knows what have, what a legal trouble we would have had with Marvel comics, you know, if we did go ahead and do that, you know what I mean? Well, now it would be with the Disney Corporation, too. So it'd be even, exactly. even worse. So maybe it worked yeah, out for the best. Yes, exactly. Way. Cool sample. But though. I mean, but that, but that, yeah, but that was the time, though. You could do those things and um, get away with them. But I don't necessarily, with the success of that record, I don't know if we ever would have, you know, I mean, because that was out there, you know what I mean? So. I don't necessarily know if we would have left unscathed on that one, but no, uh, no, probably not. <laughs> no, not at all. I always wondered why CM Punk never came out to clobbering time. Like, obviously he did the, the intro, right? But, but I always thought it'd be such a cool entrance for a wrestler. Yeah. You know, I mean, I always I wondered why CM Punk never used a fucking rancid song for a goddamn intro, you know, and that's Very a, true. <laughs> a bone of contention. I go, dude, you got a fucking guy here. Like, what is fucking wrong with you? You know what I mean? I, rem- I remember, like, uh, they were shooting a, his documentary, and, and they wanted to cut. They came and and because uh, he came to the show with us in Albany, New York, and a lot of that backstage stuff with him with us was in Albany. Yeah, and uh, and I think I, I put him on the spot that night before we did last one to die. I was like, if I was a professional wrestler this is what I would want my theme song to be. And I just kind of looked right at him and he was just kind of looking at me like, fuck you, dick. Like, why are you putting me on the spot? You know what I mean? It's like, come on, bro, brother. I mean, here I am, like this super wrestling fan. And I've never seen any one of my fucking, any song I've ever been a part Well, besides, there's been a few, you know, to come out to it. The Backyard whatever, Wrestling you know. uh, D- uh, video game. You guys are on that yeah. soundtrack? Yeah, but I mean, and there's a lot of great wrestlers, you know, that that, that have come out to bastard songs and, you know what I mean, and 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 really cool stuff, and I'm and I am honored, but uh, but it's like when it's your buddy, when it's one of your best friends, and he's not, and he's coming out to fucking you know some. I mean, I'm not taking in anything away from <clears throat> Living Color. No, that is a it's a great track. I mean, mm-hmm. let's just be honest, and um, <clears throat> you know, but and 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 it actually, honestly, the lyrical content actually fit his persona at the time, so it to- totally makes sense. But, you know, whatever. It was kind of like, throw your fucking friend a bone here, dick. You know what I mean? Like, well, I heard it through the grapevine. He might have another fight coming up that yes. maybe he needs walkout music for. So, you know. Well, uh, you never know what can happen. You never, you never know, know what can, what can happen. happen. Uh, but, yeah, no. I, I'm, I'm I, waiting for the phone call, punker. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I agree, though. I definitely agree, too. You want your WrestleMania moment. You know, you want. You know what? I need my WrestleMania. Look, I've experienced a lot in my life. Okay, granted, I've been, you know, <clears throat> fortunate enough to have some success in my life. But you know what? I've never had my WrestleMania moment, and that's the yeah. that's the one thing I'll go to my grave going. I need my WrestleMania moment. Yeah, but no, absolutely. I think that is. Joking aside. No, absolutely. I agree. <laughs> I, I I think that's totally, totally fair. And I I think also, 
you know, like that's as a wrestling fan, that's like the one big thrill that you could uh, like we have fucked up licensed Daniel Bryan or Brian Danielson at the time, uh, yeah. generation for right. the first two ROH TV tapings. And that to right. me is probably the biggest achievement of my life. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's amazing. It's amazing when you like look at your life and, 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 and your success, like what you feel is success. And I'm the same way, dude. It's like, how much have I been involved or my music or something I've done that has been involved in wrestling? That's how I measure my success. Well, I was going to say, how does it feel to have been in the best WWW, WWW, WWE DVD ever? Like, well, you, know, I, I, you know, and I thought that was a good one. I, I really honestly did. And, I'm, and I know, you know, that that's, it's easy for me to say because, it, and, you know, obviously, it, you know, the guy's my brother and, and I might be biased, but, Le- legitimately like that was like the most honest one I've ever seen them put out. Yeah. And I think it set the tone for the ones that kind of come after to be better. Exactly. So, you yeah, know, exactly. And, um, you know, and, that, and, that, and that's the thing. It's a shame that he's no longer doing it. Like I, I miss him in, in, in that, uh, in that, in, you know, cause he's such a great performer. He such had such, you know, he, he was one of the last wrestlers that r- truly have psychology yeah. and brought that to the ring. You know, I remember just that whole series that he did with Regal, you know, and to for the IC championship and just remembering the two of them, you know, having the psychological, it was a, t- a t- t- so there's that's the four year old. <laughs> Don't worry. Mine will make a run in soon. I imagine. <laughs> but you, but you know, it's like the psychology, Soren, I love you very much. <laughs> All right. Okay, so let me try to find another room. But the, psycho- but the, psych- the psychology that, that, he, that they brought to, um, you know, the ring was like something <coughs> that was – that hadn't really been seen in a long, long time. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Like and, he was – and he is like one of the, the all-time greats. And I think we all still have that, you know, Tanahashi fantasy uh, <laughs> Tokyo Dome thing to look forward to maybe. So, yeah, I'm just saying, just putting it out there. Yeah. But anyway, this is exactly what I thought was going to happen. So yeah. let's get back to your life story in <laughs> okay. punk. Okay. Uh, because, oh my gosh, I could talk wrestling with you all day. Yeah. Oh, uh, but uh, back to, you know, so what was kind of your first, like you mentioned Social Distortion was the first show that you really connected with. What was your first show show you went to? Not, it didn't even have to be punk, like concert even. Um, it was a punk show. Then I remember because I because I, I distinctly remember going to see ACDC for the first time in the big gigantic arena, mm-hmm. and I was thinking, "What well, they do? Uh, I, I, I they do concerts in places like this? Like, <laughs> you, you, you know, what I mean, like I didn't even really think, like, you know." But yeah, I was probably uh, see. There was there was a couple. Of, it, there was a couple. There was a, a Black Flag show with DOA. And I remember I got my my ass kicked by my own brother. Um, so the, here here's what happened. So it was it was at Briner Hall in Campbell, California, and I it was it was oh shit I can't remember what even fucking year it was. But anyway, it was really I was really really young. And my brother had had now clicked up with a bunch of people, and on the corner of Campbell Avenue in Hamilton. Um, there was a gas station and in behind that gas station, there was a, an alleyway <clears throat> with like a fence and you, you could go back there. A lot of the kids would go back there and drink beer, you mm-hmm. know, and because the show was literally a hop, skip and a jump from there, maybe a block away. So I remember I had gotten stoned. Somebody passed me a joint, whatever. I, I smoked it. I, I was probably about 10. Wow. 11, you know, yeah. and I, and I got stoned and I was really stoked. I was stoned, but it was dark outside. So it started kind of getting kind of creepy for me. Cause you know, you're, you know, you're 10, you're stoned, <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, and I remember my mom said, basically I could go to the show because my brother was there and that I was, I was his responsibility. So anyways, I'm walking by, I'm looking, I'm going, I'm walking around, you know, cause I'm high and the, the and I'm, I'm, I distinctly remember the, the feeling of like being high and enjoying it. Like, Whoa, this is like, I've, I've arrived. Kind yeah. Of feeling, you know? Yeah. And, and, uh, I remember walking by this fence and all of a sudden I heard this commotion and next thing you know, I'm on the floor and I'm getting kicked and I'm getting punched. And then all of a sudden I hear this voice go, Whoa, 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 stop, 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 stop. That's my little brother. That's my little brother. So basically my brother and his buddies were waiting behind this fence to roll onto somebody. 
And I just happened to be the unlucky person who walked by at that time. And uh, so he picks me up and kind of dusts me off a little bit. And he goes, you okay, man? You okay? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'm fine. And he goes, uh, he goes, uh, what's, what's wrong with you? And I go, uh, I'm really stoned, you know, like, and I'm proud as I made this statement. I'm, I'm really stoned. And he's like, you're what? I go, I'm really stoned. And all of his friends start, you know, kind of laughing like, hey, welcome to the club kind of thing. And then my brother starts just literally beating the shit out of me and saying, you're my responsibility. Mom's going to kill blah, 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 blah. You know, it starts and then makes me walk home the mile and a half back home by myself in the dark at like 10 o'clock at night. Holy. And I'm stoned and I'm and I'm scared now, you know, because it's just like it's a long walk when you're 10, number one. And when you're stoned, everything kind of moves even that much slower, mm-hmm. you know, so you add all the factors in there. Um, that's what I remember of my first punk show. And you have little kid legs, so it takes a lot longer to walk. Amen to that. Oh my! Amen to that. Wow, that's what a terrible first show. I was yeah, but, ask but you what you remember <laughs> DOA set, but I guess that doesn't really stand out that much. Yeah, no, I, you know, I can't even recall if I ever really even went into the show. Honestly, yeah, um, it was more of the scene. I mean, it was big. It was like a big, wide open world. I mean, you know, my my world at that time was like little league, and uh, you know my record collection and, and, and pro wrestling. Like it, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, there, it wasn't that big, you know, you're 10, you're not supposed to have a big world anyway. You're supposed to, you, you know what I mean? But the way we grew up though, you know, there was a lot of shit that was going down, you know I mean? Yeah. There was people getting shot and, you know, there was a lot, a lot of violence and, and gangs and stuff like that. And so, I mean, we were kind of exposed to, to sort of more, I guess with, for lack of a better term, more adult themed kind of things in the seventies, early eighties, than the kids now who are growing up now would be, you know what I mean? Or maybe they, they are, but they just, you know, maybe it's a lot more real. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm glad that my kids probably hopefully will never have to see that kind of lifestyle, you know? Yeah. Like I'm not talking about even as extreme as what you're talking about, like where you're, where you have to worry about shootings and violence, but I'm just looking, thinking about how, you know, we had a call, in, with my kid he was at a sleepover my eldest and they wanted to put on a uh like an a, like an r-rated movie and it was just like what <laughs> an r-rated movie and like i'm thinking back but i i'd seen all that stuff by the time i was seven like i already had a freddy krueger poster on my wall when i was eight see that's what i mean it's like that our you know my mom smoked when she was pregnant with me i mean yeah. come on it's like you know, it's just like they didn't, it was the seventies, man. Shit happened. Like yeah. nobody, nobody shaved and everybody like did, it was over excess. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah absolutely. You know, like, well, I think it's just like, it's just now I think we, we quote unquote know better, you know, like yeah. about a lot of things. And it's like, I, I think about even myself, like you know, I had a fairly sheltered ish upbringing, but I was still downtown Toronto going to these shows by myself at 12 years old. 13 years right. old and it's like I was exposed to a lot of crazy stuff going to these shows down being downtown going to these concerts and it's like I don't know if I'm going to let my 13 year old have the same liberties <laughs> no you know I, I mean I think about some of the things that that I've done you know in my life and at, at you know at an early age I mean I think my oldest he's like eight years old he's going to be nine in September and I think two years from now you know, basically is when I got exposed to this music, to this culture, to the scene. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's when I shaved my head. I became a little skinhead. You know, I got my pair of boots. You know what I mean? I rolled up, bleached all my jeans. <clears throat> you know what I mean? I wore suspenders, although they were like five inches thick. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> I did everything I, I possibly could. I mean, I didn't know about a Fred Perry or a Ben Sherman. We got those Britannia ones, you know, those polo shirts. Um. But yeah, I mean, and I, you know, another thought I was thinking was, was the first time I saw Social Distortion, and I followed Dennis <clears throat> Danell around the club because I, he had a Social Distortion button on his overcoat, and I wanted that button. And I remember I went up these these stairs, and it was like like this weird kind of hallway. You go up these stairs, and you go down, and you're in the other part of this room. And he waited for me in, in, for, on the other side of the stairwell because he obviously figured out that I was following him, and he goes what do you want? And I was like, I just want your button. And he goes, Oh, okay. And he actually gave me a, but his button off of his jacket. You know what I mean? And, and it was really cool. And, and yeah. we ended up the first time I ever got like had a salty dog, which is like 
uh, vodka and grapefruit juice. I was, I was in the back before the show with all the social distortion guys and it was Derek and Brent and, and Mike and, um, and Dennis. And we, then me and Dennis became friends. He like gave me his phone number, you know what I mean? And when they came through the, uh, two times later, I mean, my mom made them frozen hamburgers and they crashed on my floor, you know, when they played the American Legion Hall in Campbell, you know what I mean? Like that's the way the, the scene was, you know, they, they came over to the house, my mom's cooking frozen hamburgers and she's okay with them being punk, but she doesn't want me and my brother to be punk. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, and it's like, you got social distortion in your house, eating hamburgers with them. And then you're next thing you know, you're in the van and you're going to the show, you know? Well, like, it's funny. Cause what you, like, it's the impact that had on you as a kid. Cause like my brother, when, when, uh, Elk and the Wolves came, you guys did a, a thing at CFMY where you showed up just at CFMY to do an interview. And my yeah. brother and I were listening to the radio and heard like, Oh my God, Rance is at the radio station. We live like across town and he was like 11 and I had, to, I couldn't leave. I was grounded and had to finish a school assignment. So I'm like, <laughs> I hand him this shirt that I have that I'm staring at right now, uh, with all these bands that I got to see like the first couple of years I was going to shows. Uh, and I'm like, get this signed. And he grabbed and he grabbed the first CD he found, which was his operation Ivy CD and took off running and got on the subway and I remember seeing him nearly get hit by a car as he took off outside of our house. <laughs> and he made it there and met you guys and like got all this stuff signed. And I remember he, he telling came back and he had you you had signed his Operation Ivy CD. He's like, I felt so bad because I I had to get I had only had this Operation Ivy CD and he, and he hands it to you and you're like, oh no problem, man, I'm happy to sign this for you. I love this record. And it's just like you were you guys were at the like in the middle of this crazy shit storm that I'm sure we're going to yeah. hopefully talk about today. Yeah. And you were yeah. still cool to this kid. You know, this like 11 year old kid. So it's obvious that social distortion thing had an impact on you. Well, yeah, but, but that's the whole thing. I mean, like the punk rock, wh why I gravitated to that more than to Motley Crue is because um, I, pure, pure and simply, the, pe the people that were making the music were just the same as you. You know what I mean? And if you're coming to the punk show, then you must feel as fucked up as I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? And that to me, was uh like you said i mean there was there was there was an off uh, uh, a connection that when, when i came up through this whole thing it's like you're all one and the same you all look out for each other it's you against the world and these bands you know you felt like were yours you know that those were your bands telling people how you felt and <clears throat> and then you sing the lyrics with them and then it was like you were in the band because they were talking about what you felt uh, you know it wasn't like a far off concept I, I didn't know anything about you know you know that's why my kiss records went ended up going onto the shelf you know what i mean is it you know i i didn't know what christine 16 meant until i was like 15 <laughs> <laughs> like, okay he's a, he he likes the young ladies okay but you, you know what i mean like I did. I just thought it was a nice song about Christine. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Whatever. You know. <laughs> so I mean, not that I was that naive, but a naive enough. You know, naive enough to that world at least. Yeah. yeah exactly. So and that, but that wasn't something that seemed reachable in my world. You know, um, I never thought about you know like becoming rich and famous. You know, I never. I never like. I wanted to be, of course, because I came from you know a shitty fucking low income housing apartment building. You know what I mean? Where there was lots of craziness and lots of fucking violence and create and just, you know, gnarliness. And, and for me, like if that was a, a way out of this fucking thing that I was living, um, then I would have gladly taken it, you know, and, that, and that's kind of where my head was, but I never like had, you know, these grand, uh, visions of me becoming successful at making music. It just, it just sort of happened, you know what I mean? And, and, uh, I mean, and, and that's the thing. We were just, you know, was, as far as Rancid was concerned, we were just like four working class kids who just, you know, toured a lot and, and wrote, a, you know, some good songs that people somewhat, somewhat, you know, identified with, you know? Well, we're going to, my God, if we get into even your B-sides, we could, I was just listening to like a bunch of B-sides today and they're, oh, anyway, we'll get into that. My God, there's lots of places to go here, Lars. So many places to go, but back to where we were. Yeah. Um, you, you brought up your record collection that you had, you know, around that time you brought the kiss records, what other stuff were you getting? Was it just stuff that your brother was kind of bringing up and where were you kind of buying records at that point? Well, tower records was, was great. There was the tower records on uh, uh, Bascom Avenue and they had an import section. 
So you could go there and you could get like, you know, I found Blitz all out attack. You know, you know, I mean, I found uh, exploited computers don't bl- blunder. I found. I remember I bought the first uh, Meteors record, or not the fir- not the first record, but uh, uh, Wrecking Crew. And I did. I, I and I, it was it, it was at the time when you looked at the cover and the cover was cool. You could you'd buy it. You know? yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they they put them in these plastic sleeves, right? So you could change the price tag. You know what I mean? By just undoing the plastic sleeve and putting the record into a different plastic sleeve. Because it was just held together with a piece of tape. So all you had to do is just be a little bit sneaky about it, change the record, and boom, there you go. I mean, it's before barcodes, you know? And then all of so, a sudden you're getting a uh, Blitz All Attack for the price of a Pat Benatar single. Exactly. So And, and so the, the, the seven inches were in one room, and then you had the 12-inch final on the other side, and it was a, the total import section. And you could find everything. I mean, I bought um, – I remember when I got out of Juvenile Hall for the first time. Um, I had, I got busted for breaking and entering cruelty to animals, possession of PCP mayhem and a few other of these things. And I was 11 years old and whoa, I won't, I won't go into gory details, but basically <clears throat> I ended up, I ended up che- had this pack of chewing gum. We, me and my friend, um, uh, uh, Mike Newman, who's now dead. He died a few years after this, but we broke into this house and it happened to be like his girlfriend's house. We took the bus out there. We drank all the beer and they had this little dog and we started smoking some PCP and this dog kept barking at me and barking at me. When you're high on PCP, you don't really want a a dog to bark at you. And I remember I had this tidal wave chewing gum. It just had come out and I had the, 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 the green apple flavor. It had a liquid center. It was like all the rage, right? I remember I took the whole pack, I put it in my mouth and I wrapped chewing gum around the dog and but the dog was trying to pick it off of its fur for the rest. Of, so it stopped barking at me. Like that was my, my, the best idea I could come up with at the time, you know, to get the dog. So I got busted for cruelty to animals because this dog obviously had chewing gum all of its fur, but it happened to be like this show winning dog too. Like they had put this dog in like, you know, dog shows and stuff and whatever. So they really threw the book at me. <laughs> but, wow. But, but yeah. And so then I ended up like, you know, being high and stuff like that. And Mike started fucking with me and I ended up like taking his eyeball out with what it is. It's a long story, but we ended up getting busted. And, uh, as, and I had taken $20 out of their parents' top dresser drawer. I remember I, I'd stashed the money. I knew the cops were going to come. I somehow got on the bus fucked up. And then the cops were at my house literally three or four hours later. Cause Mike had ratted me out. Um, and, uh, I was in the back of a police car going to juvenile hall, but I had stashed the 20. So when I got out of juvie, I got my $20 and I walked down to tower records and I bought strength through oi. And, uh, that's kind of the record that really set the tone for me for like the rest of my life, which was the second oi record. I had the first, first oi record, but the second oi record is when I really was like, okay, this is it. This is, this is kind of what I want to do. You know what I mean? So and it was a compilation record, you know, and it was great because I loved comp records at the time because you had the Last Resort, you had the Toy Dolls, you had the Strike, you had, you know, all these great bands all in one collection. And, uh, you know, it was just, it was like, it was like perfect, you know, you didn't have to go buy singular, single, single records, you know what I mean? You And feel like you could get much more from it, you know what I mean? Well, as a kid, especially like when you don't have access to a lot of funds, granted, that's the... I don't have a story like that about acquiring a record, but, but you know, like that definitely like is compilations are the best way to find out about everything. Exactly. And that's why I still love them because yeah. and they are they, honestly, like a lot of my favorite records are the comps, you know, because you know, all the OI records were great. You know, I, you know, there were some that were kind of lemons, you know, like the later ones, like the, the OI of sex and just stuff like <laughs> But, Son no. of Oi, I like. There's a couple tracks on Son of Oi that are okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, they, they had. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some great songs on that. They had that wasn't there a song with that pro band on there? Yeah, uh, yeah. But so, I mean, um, you know, I always like those types of types of records mostly, and that. And but that also turned me on to buying bands' records. But then you know, but then you had Blitz coming out with like telecommunication and that other stupid fucking whack ass shit. 
you know, <laughs> fucking, I was so bummed, dude, when I bought that fucking record that I still have to this day and I've never thrown it away because if I ever wanted to meet any of those fuckers, I was going to go, what the fuck is this about, bro? <laughs> I, you, don't, you don't think that record now, I understand it, it, it hurt at the time, but isn't that, it's kind of cool in its own way? No? Hells no, bro. <laughs> Not in a fucking, if you're going to call your band fucking Blitz, you don't do a record like that. It's like if the Ramones came out with like them fucking like new romantic shit. You know what I mean? Like what the fuck? Like all of a sudden they have wave cuts. They look like flock of seagulls. No, no, it's no, no. The Ramones never did that. You know, the Ramones never let me down. Okay. What are, Blitz, Blitz let me down. Wow. Well, Mackie is a fan of the show, so maybe he will hear this now. No, I love, I look at, I love Mackie. I know Mackie, but Mackie wasn't part of that. that That's that true. He, That's true. He, he left. You know, Midge, Sorry, Midge, God rest his soul, wasn't part of that either. So yeah, that's true. That's true. He he had gone by that point. But there, was like, just prior to that, like some of those kind of like, uh, like there's some. I don't know. I like I like some of the not maybe not telecommunication, but what's the single just before it? Was it White Man like that? Something like that. No, New Age, New Age. When they oh that, no, yeah, but that's fine. That's yeah. fine. But but I mean, come on, that's a great song. That's a killer you know, song. You know, that, that was, that was great. It wasn't, you know, I mean, that, that speaks for a whole generation, I think, that's you know, true. that's true. So, and, and that's one of those songs that no matter what you, where you go, when, when you listen to it, it's still going to strike a chord with you. But um, it, it was after that, you know I mean? Yeah. Obviously. I yeah. mean, that, that, that record cover, obviously the new age record cover was, you know, obviously a glimpse of things to fucking come, but little did we know that like, <laughs> you know, we we're going to get fucking telecommunication. Like what the fuck is wrong with you people? Like, is that, I'm is sorry. that, is that why you Rancid has never phoned it in on any of your comp tracks? <laughs> Bro. Like th this is the way we th feel about Rancid. Like, you know, we've always had this kind of, kind of idea, uh, ideology. Like, you're going to spend money to come see us play, buy a record, um, you know, whatever it may be. We know what it's like to, we've all experienced in our lifetime, you know, buying a record that sucks. <laughs> you know what I mean? Thinking you're going to get something and all of a sudden it's like, oh, great. Your supply of tuna, you know, like when the price is right. Like I picked the wrong fucking door on this one. You know what I mean? So I, I feel like that we, we put all our, our heart and soul into everything that we do. And, I, and, I, and that's, that's what I try to do with every band that I've played with is take that ideology and like bring it, you know, cause I, I don't ever want to, I don't want everybody to say, I don't want ever to anybody to come up to me and say, yo, dude, I spent, you know, $12 or whatever on your record and it sucks. I mean, you know, there's always going to be people who will say that just probably now more than ever because they're going to hear this and go, well, I'm going to go up to Lars and say <laughs> yeah. that I spent 12. But that's fine. <laughs> Whatever. My point is, it's like if I feel good, like if I, uh, you know, if, if I make a record that I feel like I would buy, you know what I mean? And, I, I'm not, and it's not all about buying in dollars and cents. It's not all about that. I mean. No, but it's I'm about just, sacrifice, right? Like you, like people, you have a limited amount of resources. So what people are giving that to you. So I totally understand what correct. you're saying. Like not, a, you know, not like a capitalist thing. It's just like a no. thing. No, and it's and it's it's just kind of the way that you have you, you think about it at points. I mean, but I also go in and I and I don't you know think is this, are people going to buy this? You know what I mean? Like I, I'm just kind of like I go in and I and and, and I want to make songs that I want to hear. I want to see this, you know. And I think if we you approach it like that, it's a safe bet, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, no, because I, like I was going to say like right from that kill rock stars compilation like on it's like some of my favorite songs that you guys have are these like random comp songs like you guys stole like every comp steal every comp it's crazy but anyway we can go down that road later on so after you kind of go to that social distortion show and before you you know the unfortunate incident with juvenile hall and stuff were you going to shows in that mid gap i guess like pretty regularly or yeah, I mean, you know, it didn't matter. To me, if it if it was punk rock, I went to go see it. You know what I mean? It was, just, you know, the local bands like Ribsy, um, The Faction, um, you know, uh, any any European band I'd, I'd go and see, you know, whether it was Discharge or GBH or Angelic Upstarts or whoever it was, you know what I mean?
and you put a name on it and I've probably seen it, you know. Um I would I was always that kid that collected the flyers too, you know. So I would take all the flyers from the shows I'd been to, put them up on my wall and they were my mementos. They were, you know, you know, before tattoos, right? So you know, but uh a lot of great local bands, you know, that I would always go see and try to support just to be part of it, you know what I mean? And um that was kind of what was most important to me was being part of that part of the scene because honestly like you know at this point you know you had all those tv shows like Quincy and chips and then donahue the day my turn my you know after school special my the day my kid turned punk and you know you had all these things and and then these characters on these ep on these tv shows with name like chemical waste you know what's your name chemical waste it's like my no my name is fucking lars dude like yeah. You know what I mean? So you'd go to the mall with your friends if you had any. And, uh, you know, like my best friend after like when the punk thing happened and pretty much every single parent that I was, uh, you know, of the friends that I did have said, you cannot hang out with that guy. I got banned, uh, you know, banned from my own family. I couldn't go to Christmas or to Thanksgiving on my, cause my, my, uh, my dad's mom, my grandmother, my, my father's side and, and grandfather, um, they banned me from the house coming over, banned me and my brother, you know, blame my mom, my poor mom, Danish immigrant, saw, you know, grew up during World War II, saw our family get killed as losing control of her children. You know what I mean? Like, you know, the last so, thing you but, need is to be cut off from support at that point. Right, yeah. But my mom, you know, God bless her. She tried, you know, she was raising two boys by herself. By the time I was three, my dad was out of the picture, you know what I mean? And he would come in and out frequently you know and he, but he was always sort of supportive of us being different because he was different he was a grease you know so um you know like th there was this whole in in the family there was a lot of fear you know there was a lot of craziness you know what i mean and and growing up in a european sort of household you know where my mom's basically straight off the boat danish and you know survived a war and stuff like that you know it wasn't like going over to you know, John Smith's house, my buddy, you know, like, you know, where they were talking about something completely different at the dinner table than we were, you know, so you already felt like you didn't, you belong to begin with, you know, it wasn't leave it to beaver style. It was, you know, we talked about things that, you know, you know, if we did sit down at dinner with each other, but you know, you know what I'm saying? It was a different, you know, I think we, we were more European, you know, in that sense of where we were brought up like more with that kind of open-minded uh, sort of mentality, you know, where we accepting, you know, was a little bit more, you know, wasn't so judgmental, you know what I mean? I, And I'm not, I'm not trying to say that, you know, America's, you know, Americans are, well, Americans are, it's kind of dumb sometimes, but you know what I'm saying? But like, um, including myself, but. Well, um, Canadians are just as dumb. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, you know, we're just, we're just human beings trying to get on with our lives, but, but the, the point I'm trying to make is, is that, from the get go, I felt like an outsider. So when I, when I found the punk rock thing, when I found the skinhead thing, when I found these, that subculture, like I, it, it was, it was natural. It was as natural as like putting on your pants. You know what I mean? So, you know, it just, for me, that's where it was. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like, so I guess like, Oh, I was going to ask you, was sticky from, they're from San Jose area, right? Or no. I think Sticky was from uh, Hayward or some Hayward, shit like okay. that. They're on like some no, no, another great band from fucking social uh, social unrest. Social unrest, fucking, yeah, unbelievable band. I used to see them, and Crucifix was another one that we used to see all the oh. time, and you know what I mean. And and like you know, like I said, the Dead Kennedys, and um, I remember seeing Camper Van Beethoven, you know, with the Dead Kennedys, <laughs> you know, what with I mean? the Dead Kennedys, yeah, at the um, New Varsity in uh, Palo Alto. I remember what was seeing, the audience reaction like to Camper Van Beethoven at a Dead Kennedy show at that point? Well, you know, I it was this was like 1986, maybe. Oh, so it was later on, yeah. So you know, I mean, everybody was you know was pretty. I you know I kind of remember being kind of chill. You know, I, I don't. I mean, I would. Hey everyone! Now that the holidays are over, Factors Ready to Eat meal delivery has got your resolutions covered. Factor takes the stress out of meal planning, so you get to skip the grocery stores, the prep work, and the cooking fatigue because they have 35 chef-crafted options each week. So whether you want to try going veggie or vegan like myself, 
Whether you're like one of my kids trying to eat anything and everything that you can find, whether you're trying to go keto or calorie wise, they've got you. And there's 55 add-ons that you can also put on there. So you'll have tons of nutritious and flavorful options. Whether it's breakfast, lunch, or dinner, Factors meals are ready in two minutes. And there's snack options as well and juices and smoothies and all sorts of things. It's been amazing having Factor in the house because whether it's meals for myself or, as I said, meals for my kids... I don't have to do overpriced takeout anymore. There's delicious food that's available right down there in our refrigerator. And it was all delivered right to my door. And it was great for me having some of these vegan meals in the house because there was no stress for me. There was no cooking, no cleanup after I'd made food for the kids. I could just pop down, grab one of these, and it's ready in two minutes. Or if the kids were hungry, I'd send them down and get they could get one of the meat options and and once again, it's ready in two minutes. And you don't have to just take my word for it. You can head over to factormeals.com slash TOAP50 and use the code TOAP50 to get 50% off your Factor Meals. That code again is TOAP50 at factormeals.com slash TOAP50 to get that 50% off and see for yourself. Delicious, nutritious, the, and I, I get the kids on the podcast, but they don't feel like coming on to do the ads. They, I got to pay them, and oh my God, it gets messy. It's riot, though, when the DKs played there, everybody started up the shit, but, and, um, you know, I saw Suicidal, you know, all those bands, you know, like, there wasn't, you, if there was a show, you went, you know what I mean? When Crucifix came through, did they come through with AF that time, or? Uh, I can't recall if they came. When they did that... Sp- they had that Punk Skins United tour. I, I only that. know because of all the flyers. You know, I remember that. I, I, I could have been there. I don't know. There were so many shows. But Crucifix was a local band. They were Berkeley, San Francisco. So, so they would play in the Bay Area, it seemed like, every weekend. And it's the same with the Dead Kennedys, too. Like, you felt like you saw the DKs every weekend. It was like, oh, what are you going to do? Oh, Dead Kennedys. Let's go there. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, that's what it felt like. I mean, the amount of times I saw the Dead Kennedys – probably there's probably only one other band that i've seen more than them and that's probably gbh or more motorhead you know like i've seen gbh probably i would it's safe to say over 300 times like but yeah i mean that's what that was what it was like being in the bay area during that time you know there was so many great bands from so many different parts you know it, you know you had blast from Sa- santa cruz you had you know bands like um you know crucifix and you know i mean not, not all at the same time but Every every part of the Bay Area contributed a band or nine team. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. You know, so it's like there was always something to do. You know? Yeah. And then when Mike was on uh, the episode, he talked about like moving uh, up to the Bay from LA and just how it was different because there wasn't as like obviously there was violence, but there right. wasn't as much violence. So it was almost like you could go to a lot more shows and and see a lot more stuff. It seems. Yeah, well, we didn't have the problems we did that they did down there, you know. Um, the, it was violent in like the early '80s, like it, it got bad, you know. But and, and a lot of times there'd be guys coming up from down south, trying to like you know, uh, you know, flex a little bit. And then then you had the problems with like the fucking boneheads. They were coming around a lot, and and uh, you know, a lot of people at points were scared to go to shows, you know, just because of. You know the itty, you know that that stupid shit. But a lot, a lot of those, a lot of those guys that turned out that way, I knew them when they all had skateboards. You know what I mean? And we, we uh, like a joke with, uh, like within ourselves was like, oh yeah, oh, here comes a white power skinhead. You know, he was probably the little kid, skinny kid with the skateboard that everybody picked on. You know, what <laughs> I mean, now he's found a sense of power. Like you know, you know, it's just it was just kind of you know stupid. But, um, you know, that, that sort of all kind of went away, got beat out of the scene. You know I mean? A lot of people didn't stand for it. You know, a lot of people, you know, you know, you know, they didn't come, they don't come around no more, put that way. Well, there's that famous photo from the floor punch show where the Nazi skinhead's about to get smacked with a bat from behind and yeah. stuff. And it's like, so it's still something that I guess beats strong in that, you know, that, that community, that scene, your scene, I guess. Well, I, well, the thing about it is I don't call Nazi skinheads skinheads. They're, yeah, they're bonus. boneheads. Cause I mean, yeah, cause I if apologize. you're, yeah. well, no, but I mean, it's like skinhead comes from Jamaican reggae, 
if that, if that's the origin, if that's the soundtrack, there's no way you could you can tout any kind of uh, bullshit fucking um, you know neo Nazism. There's just it's just it's 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 a contradiction in terms. You know what I mean? Like you can have your politics and and lean to the left or lean to the right. I mean, it's America. Do what you want. You know, but like um, it, th- those two and two don't go hand in hand. Absolutely. Um, so I guess like at this point, there's also that famous story that I wanted to ask you about, about you and MDC. Uh, I think it was in details magazine in that feature way back when I remember reading it, like getting, was it like them or was it the UK subs that smuggled you in, in a drug case? Yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, oh, <laughs> oh, fuck. You got to bring that up. All right. So, all right. So I'm, I'm 19. I joined the UK subs, right? And we're going up to Scotland, and it's like my third show with the band. I've done two shows, um, you know, and they said, Lars, do you have a Scottish passport? And I say, a Scottish passport? And they say, yeah, you need to, did you not get it when you, you came in? Did you not tell them that you're going to, like, they come up with this fucking story, and I'm like, no. And then, and so they're obviously taking the piss out of me, right? Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm 19 and I don't know any better, you know what I mean? So I'm like, ah, oh, no, I didn't get that. So we, we had this uh, old, like, Mercedes van that they had, this guy named Gaz had that we, we, we would all drive in. But it had an exhaust leak. So there was, like, a hole on the, on the floorboard in the back. Yeah. And um, so we would cover it up with an amp. <laughs> Right, so we put a Marshall a Marshall cabinet uh, with the back down on top of the hole, right, and it would sit in the middle of the of the van. So they said, "Oh fuck, we're gonna have to smuggle you in." So okay, well we're we're almost to the border, Lars. You, you're gonna need to hide yourself. I'm like, what the fuck? And I'm like, oh great. So I'm you know I'm like, okay, what do we, you know got to do what I got to do. You know what I mean? <laughs> So, you know, I want, you know, I mean, what am I, what am I going to say? You know? <laughs> yeah. you know? It's your first time there too, probably. Right. Like... It, it is my first time there. That's why, that's why they're easy, you know, taking the piss out of me. So where the hole is on the floor, I, uh, Brian Barnes, the bass player goes, Oh, let me help you, mate. I got a great idea. And I go, fine. He goes, here, help me pick this up. So we lift up the marshal. He goes, you cover the hole. I remember I was, I was wearing this sheepskin jacket. I'll never forget it because there was a spot on that sheepskin jacket right where I was covering the hole. And he goes, I'm going to put the marshal on you. You, you hold on to it. So basically, <laughs> and then I feel like these bags being thrown on my feet. You know what I mean? Uh, the, now that, you know, I, so I'm holding this marshal cabinet <laughs> on top of me. I'm face up. I got my head to kind of to the side and I'm just thinking, fuck, I you know, fuck. I hope I don't get caught. I hope I don't get caught. That's what's going through my fucking head. Right. <laughs> assholes and it obviously gas is like swerving you know if you see the puppies hitting it you know what i mean and uh, so this goes on for about like about a half an hour 45 minutes i don't know or at least it seems that much and all of a sudden i hear charlie like like giggling <laughs> and i'm like what the fuck right and i'm like and then all of a sudden like everybody's kind of snickering and kind of whispering and stuff like that and i'm like Oh, maybe we're getting close to the border. No, they're just fucking laughing at the fucking stupid American that's got the fucking Marshall cabinet clogging the hole to the exhaust so the exhaust doesn't come into the fucking van and kill us all. Like, that's what I'm doing. And basically I kind of figure it out and I get up and then I, I put, throw the amp off of me and I, and I kind of sit up and everybody just starts pointing and, and laughing at me like, you fucking idiot. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> so. Oh, well. I don't think that's the story I was bringing up because I think the story I remember hearing was that you were smuggled in in a drum case when you were underage to a show, or you had to sit in a drum to keep it from rolling. Oh, the, oh, okay. With oh. MDC, that's the story I was no, thinking. No, no, about. that that was for the Necros. That was for the Necros. The Necros is as Ronnie. Oh, okay. Ronnie Tannehill's backyard party. Okay, so I'm 11 years old, <laughs> yeah. and 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 it's like the faction, the Necros. Uh, living abortions. Uh, fuck, who else was there? What backyard a show. party. Yeah, just it's just some backyard party. It's, it's Ronnie Tannehill's like 16th or 17th birthday. His parents were like just smoking and drinking with everybody. His kegs, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. So I go. There's some pictures. Murray Bowles actually. There's a, a he, he was at the show apparently and took a bunch of these pictures. So there's like 
pictures of this 11 year old Lars with my bleach jeans and my kind of long hair and my, my, uh, my, um, flannel shirt and my, my boots. And what ended up happening was, is the drum kit, because it was, it was on concrete, um, it kept sliding and they tried to put cinder blocks and all these things and, and, and throughout the whole show, you know, the drummer was having issues. So finally, like, I don't even remember, I was sitting on the side watching the band and somebody yelled, and I want to say it was either um, Corey O'Brien, who was Gavin's younger brother, said, why don't you just stick fucking Lars in the fucking thing? And and everybody kind of looked at me and it was like, great idea. Let's stick the fucking, you know, 11-year-old in the fucking kick drum. And that's kind of what happened. They they stuck me in the fucking kick drum so it quit moving. And I had to sit there for the faction. There's a picture of me sitting in it for the faction. And there's a picture of me sitting in it for the necros. And so I had the best I had the best spot on the you know on the stage obviously, but all I could hear was the fucking kick drum. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. So, not not I, not an audio ideal spot. No, but I remember what's his name from um, from Necros, the singer. I got Jerry Hetzler. Yeah, he yeah. came up to me and he goes, "Hey, thanks, man. I really appreciate it." And he goes and gets me a, a t-shirt, and there was like this silk screen t-shirt with this small ass print. But the t-shirt was like fucking, you know, like an extra large or something, <laughs> and it looked like a dress on me. You know what I mean? And he's like, you know, but he was really cool. You know, he, he gave me a beer, and he's just like, "Hey, thanks a lot." You know, and but that's you know, I was a dumb kid. I didn't know any better. Like somebody asked me to sit in a drum kick now, I'm like, "Fuck you." <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But um, but yeah, no, that, that there's pictures out there. Yeah, I was like 11 years old. I mean, that's no wonder why I'm fucking deaf. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you paid your dues early. Holy jeez. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, those ways, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> so, sure. at which point did you? Uh, start playing music obviously that was your first uh major stage experience but <laughs> um shit um so i i, I guess I, I you know i i always i always wanted to play the guitar um i think somebody gave me a bass when i was about 13 and it had two strings on it and uh i never ever played it and then my brother brought home he got a guitar and it was like this um uh stratocaster copy that he had put budweiser labels all over because they kind of stick and then he put like so it was like this budweiser labeled guitar and i remember i used to sneak it from underneath his he'd put it underneath his bed and if you ever caught me he beat the shit he said don't touch my fucking guitar and but of course you know when you tell me not to do something i do it right so and your brothers you have to Oh yeah, absolutely. It's like a rite of passage to yeah. get your ass beat on a daily. And my brother was a very gnarly motherfucker. You know what I mean? So like getting beat up by him wasn't like getting beat up. It was like getting like fucking named. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. He wouldn't stop. I remember one time he attacked me with a butter knife and when I was in the shower and he started making, you know, that psycho who goes, ee, 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 you know, that thing. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was, he was legit like crazy. Like if anybody ever fucked with me, or, or try to beat me up or whatever, he would go over to their house and destroy them and then come back and beat the shit out of me. Like, <laughs> why did you make me go do that to him? You know what I mean? Like, he, you know, he was, but he was, he was a great guy. I mean, you know, we, we hated each other for a long time, you know, but before he died, it was, it was kind of amazing. It was like, you know, we, we sort of saw, you know, about a couple of weeks before we kind of started seeing eye to eye for the first time, and, which was kind of nice. But, um, you know, he, uh, I kind of got off, off, off target. But. No, no, absolutely. You're talking about playing, stealing his guitar. Gotcha. So that's the first time I, I, and I would sit with every record I had. It didn't matter what kind of record it was. And I would just try to sound like that. Like I make sure that this sounds good. To, what I'm playing sounds that no one ever really showed me a bar chord. I think I saw somebody playing it on MTV or whatever. And I tried it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I would then I would go to live shows or whatever, and I would see the bands how they do it. And Mike Ness actually, when I was about eleven years old, taught me how to play, telling them on the E string of his. Uh, he had it like his Cherry Sunburst um, Les Paul. I remember being in the, in the, at this house, and uh, he was kind of the first one that gave me the guitar and said, "Here, play it." And he just showed me on the E string how to play, telling them. 
What an awesome what, story. Yeah. Oh, and, um, I mean, we were, you know, he was high on fucking speed and shit and doing all of his makeup and, you know, doing the whole skit for me from fucking another state of mind. <laughs> it looks like someone crying, you know? <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I would totally remember it. it was, I mean, cause, but we were friends. Yeah. It was, it was, you know, it so was and th- that was the first time I picked up a guitar was through him. He let me play his guitar and then I would steal my brothers a few years later and I would just try to make sounds. And then Simon Woodstock, who became a pro skateboarder, he was l- from my neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And he had a brother who was in a band. Um, and, and that was where I got my first guitar. Because I bought my – I did Simon's paper route for – oh, it was like two months. And, it was, and he wanted to sell me his uh, – it was like this purple Les Paul Jr. that I used. And it's, the, it's what turned out – the cover of the Roots Radicals seven inch is that guitar smashed, okay? Because I because the the band Ransom bought me a new Epiphone <laughs> in '93 for my birthday, and because um, the guitar was shit, you know. Yeah. And but I smashed it. We played with Bad Religion at the um, Palladium, and I smashed it during Hyena because we always would close with Hyena, and I smashed it, and I still actually have the remnants of it in my garage. But that was the first guitar I ever owned and I paid $150 although I was it was kind of like I I was an indentured servant because I did you know somebody's paper route for 2 months and that's how I got the guitar. I was about 16 when I got Wow. That. You put in your work for that guitar but also what an iconic like you carried it through and still made it even in death ring on for eternity. <laughs> that guitar. Also yeah. what was Simon Woodstock's brother's band? I don't know, but he 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 had like an older brother, and I think he was like um, like a stepbrother. Like his mom, his mom had married a new guy, okay, and it was his son from his first marriage, and it was like a rock band. And um, but the guitar had belonged to a, a guy in a band called the Purple People Eaters. Oh, okay. And there's some, and I've tried to do my research on them yeah. back in the day. I haven't really looked at it, but. I, they were a legit band. I don't think I think they had like a minor hit, but the guitar was purple. <laughs> That's awesome. But, but that I, was this, I actually think I heard like that did, were they like a 60s or 70s band? I think I think so. I think so. And his brother had some sort of connection. He either played in the later formation of that band. I mean, th- th- I mean we're talking this is 1980. So I, I might have been younger than 16. So this is like 1985, 86 when I got that guitar. Wow. Well, do you remember also when Simon Woodstock fight, fought Mike Muir? Uh, I do recall that, <laughs> but by then, you know, Simon had gone, we, we kind of gone our different ways. He's now like a Baptist minister now or something, the last time I heard. Wow. I had no idea about that part. I just remember the Mike Muir fight. And I think it's on YouTube too, even now. Yeah. Um, Doesn't uh, he kick his ass though, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, yeah. That's what I remember kind of unfolding in yeah the- well S- simon had a lot of pent-up aggression and and, and i and he's ripped down, to shit yeah well i threw down many many times with simon side to side and, and i know i know what he was capable of you know what I mean? yeah absolutely well lars i have kept you for a long time and my <laughs> god we haven't even gotten to you joining the uk subs <laughs> <laughs> this is the greatest episode ever well, I mean, you know, tell me what you want to do. I'm, I'm free. If you want, let's do. Do you want to? Are you? Can you talk for uh, like a few more minutes, and then we'll call it an episode. Whatever you want to do. I mean, this is it's on you, bro. Like, oh. if you want to talk all day, I can do that. Like I said, I got this is the first time in a long time I got nothing going on. Well, like, then the I'm gonna have to gone. keep you. I'm gonna have yeah, to the keep. Kid, the, the kids are gone. The wife is gone. It's it's like the perfect day to catch me. Well, my kids are downstairs chilling with my wife comfortably, and so I am ready to keep going. Okay. Let's, <laughs> do Let's, do Let's do it. Let's do it. So uh, I guess, like, so you start playing, and what do you, what do you remember, like, when you first started playing with a band or the first people you played with? Yeah, you know, it's uh, funny because um, the first band that I really ever got into was this band called the Nowhere Men. Okay. And that was with Gordy who later became the unknown bastard in the bastards. Oh, wow. Okay. And, um, oh, I think I knew that actually. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. So he was the singer and it was an oi band and this is like 1988, 89. Um, and we had a, a Ken head, 
we called him Ken Ed because he was a skinhead and his name was Ken. He played the drums. We had this guy named Brandon, who was this long haired metal guy on guitar, me on guitar, pasta on the bass. Um, and then Gordy sang and we did like these, these, um, we actually did a demo. Um, I, I don't, I, I don't even have a copy of it myself. I don't think I have to take a look, but, um, it was just, you know, shouting oi, you know, I remember one of the songs was called working class. And it was like, working class, strength through oi, working class, not a politician's toy, working class, strength through oi, let's get together now. Like that was the chorus, you know. Yeah. You know, it was, it was, you know, obviously very juvenile, but, you know, that was, that was kind of the first thing. We did some shows with like, we play with the mentors, we play with aggression, we play with JFA, Blast, Capital Punishment. You know, we well, slow lot. down. You just play with like a, an unbelievable list of bands that you said there. That's yeah. awesome. Holy. Well, but I mean, the, you know, and Those the Melvins, locals, I guess, right? Yeah. When we played with the Melvins at one point, we pl- actually played. That's how I got the gig in the UK subs because we played the Omni at this all day punk fest and the subs were played the Gilman. It was, they played it at a matinee. So after their show, they came over to, to the punk fest and the headliners were the Melvins. And it was like the Melvins. JFA, uh, Capital Punishment. They're from Fresno, if I remember correctly. And then, and Blast. And we, and we had played Blast with Blast a few times because, um, so I knew Clifford and so that he would invite us to play. Um, and so the UK sub, so Charlie and the guitar player, Carl at the time, who had been in the exploited, he was on that horror epics record and, um, they came down to the show and ironically at the time, the nowhere men were doing organized crime, which was a UK sub song and he saw us playing it. And I went to the bar after the show and I, I, I just went, I went to go order a beer or whatever with the drink ticket and Charlie Harper's right there. And he's like, Hey, great set tonight. And I looked over and I'm like, Oh fuck, it's Charlie Harper. And I go, um, and I go, Oh cool. I heard you guys were playing over at Berkeley. How'd it go? And he goes, I went, well, he goes, I loved your version of organized crime. It was really good. You played the guitar perfectly because whatever. And he was really, really nice. And uh, so we started talking and he goes, let me buy you a drink. So he bought me a beer and we sat down and we started talking and, you know, making small talk and just talking about, you know, whatever punk and, you know, what happened to this guy? And, you know, I, cause I remember him, there's a picture of him on the back of the second Oi record. And I asked him about the photo and, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, just, just, just trying to, you know, just being, you know, whatever friendly. And so he says to me, like about 15 minutes into the conversation, Hey, you know, we're losing our, um, our guitar player after this tour. Um, you know, would you be interested? And I was like, um, yeah, but I thought, you know, I thought he was just like trying to be nice or something. I, you know, no one had, you know, Hey, you're good enough to do this or something. And I was like, yeah, I'm interested. And he goes, well, g- give me your number. And I was at my mom's house, still living there. Cause I'd, I was kind of going back from there, back and forth from Hayward where I was living with this girl to my mom's, you know, depending if we were fighting or not. Right. Mm-hmm. So at that point we were fighting. So I was staying down in Campbell still. So and he said, well, I'm going to be in Oakland for like three or four days. Uh, it was a, fr- uh, a s- I think it was a Friday when this gig was. And, um, no, it was a Sunday and he said, I, um, I'm going to be here till next weekend. Let's get together on, on Friday next week and you come down and we'll talk. And I, cause I'm going to be in Oakland. And I was like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So anyways, he gives me a number where he's staying. He called some girl over. They were staying at some house in Oakland. I get this phone number Friday rolls around. I don't call him because I just thought, you know, he's, he's not, he's just, you know, he was just being nice or whatever. Mm-hmm. Saturday morning at about 9 a.m., I get a call. I'm sleeping on my mom's living room floor and it's Charlie Harper saying, yes, I'm looking for laws, blah, 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 blah. Um, this is Charlie and you know, whatever. And so I fucking, I pick up the phone and I'm like, hey, Charlie, it's Lars. And he goes, hey, what happened? I thought we were going to get together yesterday. I'm like, <laughs> Uh, oh, I go, you know what, Charlie, I, I didn't, I didn't think you were being that serious. He goes, what do you mean? I'm deadly serious. He goes, what are you doing 
today or tomorrow, he says. And it was it would have been Sunday. And I said, um, nothing. He said, well, can you come and meet me in Oakland? And I said, yes, I can. So um, I go. So, you know, I've had the Saturday, the Sunday. Um, my mom was going to this place called the Nordic House, which is like where you get Danish food, right? Mm-hmm. And it just so happens to be on Telegraph where... Well, it's not, it's no longer there. It's on San Pablo. Uh, no, it's on San Pablo. Sorry. Over in Oakland. And it's in like deep in the heart of the shitsville of Oakland at the time. Right. And it's, and it's, she was going to go up there and get some cheese and Danish salami, whatever. And she goes, you know what? I'm going up there on Sunday. I can drive you up there. And I'm like, great. So my mom drives me and I'm, so she dumps me off at the Nordic house. Um, I, it's right now, it's like 11 o'clock in the morning and Charlie says, you know, if you, if you walk down the street and I see a Winnebago basically on the road, right? And I, and I knock on the door and they're all there except for Carl. Carl's not there. And basically we sit down and we talk and me and Charlie hang out. We go, we went and saw that night. We got, first off, we got lost on the BART together. We were trying to get over to the, to San Francisco. We ended up way out like in Walnut Creek or whatever. I said, Charlie, I think we got on the wrong train because we were talking so much. So we finally get over to San Francisco. We go to Haight Street and we went to this place called the, um, the I-Beam. And we went and saw uh, Buck Naked and the Bare Bottom Boys. I don't know if you remember that, that no. person. Well, I think, I think he ended up getting murdered at Dolores Park or something it's later sometime. Wow. But um, we ended up hanging out. And I ended up spending the night in the Winnebago. We, you know, we have a few beers, you know, blah, blah, blah. He says, listen, my wife is from Kenosha, Wisconsin. I'm going to be there for the next couple months. Um, you know, uh, can you send me a demo tape of your band so I can see Bubba Wilson, this and that? I said, sure. So we part ways. I make it back home. Um, you know, I, I get a tape of the Nowhere Men. I send it to him. And on my birthday, um, I get a letter back from Charlie. And it, and I had stayed, I remember I was high on fucking speed. I was so high. And because uh, it was my birthday. So yeah, it's your birthday. Time. Yeah. And I was high on speed and I was still drunk. And my mom said, I, I came home at like 11 o'clock. I spent the night with this, uh, my, this girl. I was kind of seeing. I spent the night with her. Um, I come home. Oh, I was actually with Gordy. I was with Gordy and his wife. This, I mean, obviously this is, you know, fucking 24 five plus years ago, <laughs> but her parents were out of town. We threw a little party at the house for my birthday, uh, the night before. So I come home, I'm on my birthday. I get this letter from Charlie basically saying you're in the band. I can't believe you want to leave your band to join my band. You're, you're great, but you're bubbles and that. This not, we need to make plans. We have a show on October. This is August 30th. So he says, we have a show on October Blah, 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 with the X-ray specs. And this is when those first, these kind of first punk, big punk festivals where they're getting a lot of these older bands and putting them all together. So it was like The Lurkers, X-ray specs, uh, Vibrators, UK subs, uh, Chelsea, you know. What is this all like for you, though? Like, because this is your shit. Like, this, like, you know, obviously, Oi is more your stuff. But I mean, like, what's it like, even like the UK sub thing happening to you as like a kid going through this? Well, see, that's the, that, that, that's the crazy part because I remember, you know, my, Sean having another kind of blues that the first UK subs record. I, I don't know how many times I listened to that record. Uh, it's probably in the thousand. I lo- I mean, the UK subs when I, you know, uh, started like, you know, spiking my hair and putting on leather jackets with studs, UK subs always made my jacket. So here I am now about to join this band. I'm like thinking to myself, like, how the fuck does this happen? Here's the irony of it. As I, uh, during my conversation with Charlie, he goes, so you're from Campbell, right? I go, yeah. And he goes, yeah, I lived there for a year in 1974. And he goes, do you remember a bar called the apple? And I'm like, oh my God, he did really live here in 1974. You know what I mean? <laughs> wow. So, yeah, I was dating a girl, you know, cause he was a hairstylist. Mm-hmm. That's what he did for a living, you know? And he was dating some girl from California. She lived in Campbell. He was dating her. He moved to Campbell. 
Little did I know that when I was three fucking years old or two years old, Charlie Harper, a guy I would later become in a band with, was going to the Apple Bar. Well, I can still take you there now. It's still there, that bar? I'm pretty sure it is. It's right where my mom lives now. Wow. Well, that is an historic bar, to say the least. I had no idea he lived in America for a time. Uh, neither did I. But when he dropped that knowledge, that's when I knew, you know. But And, and Charlie's not yeah, he's not a liar either. No. He's not someone. So anyways, that's in my mind. But so I get, I, so this is what happens. Um, I, 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 I go, mom, I got this opportunity. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to move to England. And she says, well, you know what? I can't help you. You know, you're going to have to, you know, get there yourself. And I say, okay, fine. So I, I let Charlie know I can't get there because I got to work. Now I have to go get, get, get a job and get enough money. My plan is. I'm working at Togo's, which is a sandwich restaurant, and I go and get this job, and I figure, okay, if, I, if uh, the plane ticket's about 400 bucks, I'm going to need about, you know, what, I don't know, $200, I don't know. Um, I remember my aunt gave me a check for $25 for my birthday, right? And I, I haven't cashed it yet. Um, so basically, I get this job at Togo's, you know, I tell everybody in the band, you know, hey... I'm going to go join the UK subs. You know, Gordy's always obviously very supportive of me. You know, always has been, always will be. Um, and, uh, you know, I go and I join the UK subs. I fly over there in November of that year. And uh, he literally and, lost his love to the UK subs. About yes, that. he literally did. He literally did. So, um, you know, I, I landed. I was shit hammered drunk. They barely let me into the country. Um, I had like five suitcases with me because I didn't know any better. <laughs> uh, I pretty much packed up everything I ever owned, you know, because I, I, you know, except for my records, I left my records behind. Yeah. Um, you know, I ended, I ended up just getting rid of so much shit because I had, you know, I, whatever, it doesn't matter. But, um, you know, I end up moving there. I have four hundred dollars in my or two hundred dollars in my pocket. I, I. You know, I quit the job as soon as I got enough money for the plane ticket. I bought the plane ticket. You know, um, my my uh, girlfriend at the time takes her and this guy named Elliot, who was her roommate's boyfriend, dropped me off at San Francisco International. I flew to England, and next thing you know, I'm in a fucking uh, 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 one bedroom apartment in Brixton, and um, sleeping on the floor with three other people. You know, and that's the way. We did it, you know, and the next in a week later or two days later, we're in the rehearsal room. You know, I've learned 45, 50 of their songs um, and we're just we're just going through the songs. Hey, can you do this one? Hey, can you do this? Yes, yes, yes. And we have maybe a four hour rehearsal and I play my first show two nights later. Wow, and that first shows that X-ray specs lurkers super bill type thing. No, no, I missed that one because I I, I had you to get make that a plane ticket. Yeah, yes. So of course. And, that, and that's pretty much how it happened. Little did I know that three four months later I'd be on a plane home because I was such a fucking wreck. You know, because I when I when I joined that band, like I was so far into my drinking and using mm -hmm. that like. I, the, the one of the most embarrassing times I've ever had on stage was in a, at a UK sub show, and it was at the um, we uh, were su main support for Discharge because um, Cal had rejoined the band. They put out this record called Massacre Divine, um, and uh, we were at the Nottingham Rock City, and I remember, or was it was it Nottingham? It was one. Of, it was at Rock City somewhere. It was a bigger venue, mm -hmm. and I was so hammered that I went down to to turn a knob on my distortion pedal. I fell off the stage. Yeah, I knocked my guitar out of tune, and there was a band called Blitzkrieg who was opening some of the shows. He oh yeah, the the band that was on uh, No Future. Correct. Oh, that band. Yeah, yeah, I love that seven inch. Okay, so the 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 guitar player gives me his guitar. Little do I know it's uh, tuned a whole step down. I'm so drunk, I can't tell. So we're playing Born a Rocker, Die a Rocker, and I'm completely out of key. Uh, it was embarrassing for everybody else. Uh, remember Charlie 
there was these fucking crazy motherfucking skinhead security that had all these Rottweilers. For whatever reason, the Rottweilers hated everybody except for me. I, I literally, I literally slept with the dogs that night. <laughs> I was, I, it was so fucking cold. It was in the middle of December. It was like one of the coldest winters that they had, had in a long time. And I had like six Rottweilers. <laughs> And I'm in a fucking van with all these fucking crazy ass skinheads with face tattoos. You know what I mean? And the, yeah. the, the dogs are keeping me warm. They wouldn't even let me get my sleeping bag out of the fucking van. So I embarrassed them pretty much. So that that's kind of how that whole thing ended. You know what I mean? But you were super young to be going through that experience. Well, like- that was the thing. I was 19. You know, and these guys had been well-traveled veterans. Charlie at the time, I think, was close to 50. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so, and then Pete Davies was in the band, who was the uh, the drummer on Another Kind of Blues. And um, I think the first seven inch as well. Because their original guitar player was this black guy named, um, God, what was his fucking name? He's the guy that wrote CID. Oh, that's so, like so sick. Yeah, and I forget his fucking name. Um, you know, so I was in, I was in, I was in that. So it was me, Brian Barnes, who was the closest in age to me, who was, I think 27 or 28 at the time. And then there was Charlie and Pete who were about the same age. So they had already seen that, been there and done that. They had done that, you know, 20 years prior to me joining the band. So they didn't, they didn't really want, you know, some 19 year old kid. Yeah. I could play the songs to a T, but you know, I was also a handful. I mean, I, I got them banned from this town called Ironbridge. They could never go back there again uh, because of my antics. You know, I, like, like it's the only time I've ever gotten a ban banned from a town, and it happened to do, be the UK subs. And it's funny because we did a photo session there in the morning before the local townspeople came and said, don't ever come back. <laughs> Um, and, and Charlie actually reminded me of it. I was with him when he, when he had his apartment about 10 years ago and he gave me the actual photo. He said, Do you, because me and Charlie had a big falling out after that, you know, cause he had an idea about how he wanted me to be. And of course I was 19 and wasn't going to listen to anybody. I mean, my mom couldn't change me from the way I acted. Like who the fuck is this? My punk rock idol telling me I need to be, look this way or act this way. Like, fuck you, you know, yeah. you fuck you know, and so I, I bad mouthed them in the in the in this interview I did when I joined Rancid, and um, I was remember I was working at Tower Records right before we were about to make Let's Go, and I picked up this fanzine and it said interview with the UK subs, and for whatever reason I opened it up to um, the page where they're talking to Charlie, and they asked the question, you know, Lars from Rancid. Um, you know, talks some smack about you, you know, like I can't even remember how it was even worded. You know, what do you say about that? And and the way Charlie answered that question made me feel about, I don't know, less than two inches tall. And uh, it was really humbling, you know, because mm-hmm. I, I, I kind of bad mouthed him, you know, because I was angry, you know, um, I, I said some things, you know, whatever, you know, I was just, I was, I was dumb, but I, uh, it was great because in 1995, you know, Rance had played in, at the underworld in Camden and over in England. And I got to meet Charlie and we, 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 we hugged it out. And ever since then, he's, you know, he's been like a grandfather to my kids, you know? So. No, we got to open for him one time and what, like still this day, what a, like an amazing kind of legend to still be that guy. And he's still, yeah. he was awesome to us too. Well, that, that's the way he is, though. I mean, that, yep. he'll 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 continue doing it, and he's like one of the most humble guys in the world, and he's got a great knowledge, you know, of of everything, you know, and and I and I just never, you know, well, he never left too. Like, you know, like where are they now? It's correct. not like really about the UK subs, right? It's true, it's true. Um, my God, Lars, do I want to talk to you forever? Uh, but I should let you go. Because, okay. Um, this has been awesome, and we aren't even at you joining <laughs> Rancid. And I have like I have a sh- like as I told you in advance, sheets of questions to get to myself. 
Okay. But I will. But thank you, man, for doing this. This has been an unbelievably fun conversation. I've had a blast. Well, that, you know, I, I had a great time too. This is probably the best interview I've ever done. So if you ever want to continue where you left off, I'm happy to do that. Oh, my God. Well, congratulations, everyone. You've just met your new Turn It Upon co-host. <laughs> <laughs>